Guys, this is a story of an, an experiment that's ongoing. So my name is Hugo Smitter. I'm a platform architect with FICO. And when I mention FICO, immediately my friends say, OK, FICO, this guy, can, what can you do for my score, my credit score? Everybody conjures the image of scores. And it's true, FICO is a company that is well known for the score business. But FICO is much more than, than scores. FICO is a company that provides services and various capabilities for our clients to essentially make better decisions, smarter decisions, faster. And we've been around for 68 years. I haven't been around with them for 68 years. But uh, in those 68 years, yes, the business started with um, scores. That's the core uh, well-known established business at FICO. But FICO offers, has grown through the years, an ecosystem of solutions to address pretty much every manageable use case in the finance industry, mostly, although we have customers in other industries. These businesses, each one has, within FICO, grown as, as its own profit and loss um, um, business. And they're pretty much independent. And through time, what has happened and like many of your companies probably have gone through, realize that if you factor out the commonalities of these common businesses and you focus on building as a platform, you can monetize the platform better and you can offer more nuanced solutions, better solutions to your customers and enable this platform to your partners also for them to combine various components and generate even more value for their customers. So this evolution from point solutions to a platform, it's fairly painful, it, it's, it's, but it's worthy. And we're in this journey still of building our platform. And part of that, part of that construction led us to uh, pick up an event service to handle our, the intercommunication between our components. The more components we have in our platform, the more different paradigms we need to connect these components with each other. So the event service is something that um, is one of those architectural services that we have to build. So part of this story of this experiment is when we picked that middleware, which in our case was Apache Pulsar, we're migrating from Apache Kafka to Pulsar, we also needed an abstraction layer to uh, protect us from locking us into the Apache Pulsar API. It's one that, like one of those bad breakups where, hey, uh, you don't want to repeat the story of locking yourself with Apache Kafka APIs. If we move to this thing called Apache Pulsar, what are you going to do to protect yourself from being, again, <laughs> a few years from now, locked into Apache Pulsar? So that's where Dapper comes in. Now, I want to raise your hand. This is a platform engineering event. So who's familiar with Crossplane? It has used Crossplane. Obviously, there are a lot of people here. Now, what about Dapper? Have you heard of Dapper? Use Dapper? OK, great. So this experiment is about matchmaking Crossplane with Dapper. And you think, well, what are, what are the synergies here? Why are you combining these two things? And that's the point of the story. And as I was running this experiment, an ask was made of, OK, can you help us with policies? How can you improve the way we check that our CI CD, which is based on Crossplane, our one engineering system, um, is compliant with the policies that we want to implement for these things that we're deploying? And one of our policy engines is Kyberno. Are you familiar with Kyberno? You know, missing controllers and so on. OK. So I use the policy um, evalu evaluation in, in our CI CD pipeline as a, a proof of concept of how this integration with Dapper could work with Crossplane. And I'll get into the motivation of it. So here's the agenda basically, a Crossplane overview. Look, uh, I can't do a better job than the folks from Upbound. Folks like uh, Victor Farsik, Stephen Borelli, Jared Watts, their videos are awesome. So um, I'm just have a you know, cursory description of the basic functions of Crossplane. But I want to focus on functions. Because what the change that happened last year is that Crossplane came up with this wonderful 
set of features called the cross-plane functions. A function brings cross-plane to another level where now you can do very sophisticated things programmatically. And with that great power comes uh, also technical challenges, how, challenges of how you provide these capabilities to your engineers in, in a governed way, in a, in a way they can, they can take full advantage of cross-plane. So there are opportunities and challenges using functions. And, and I'll get into Dapper without getting into a lot of detail. I have in the presentation slides that you can look at, they're tailored for cross-plane. So it's, these are Dapper slides, but I customized them for cross-plane. So you can see where these two worlds meet. Then I'll show you how to integrate Dapper with Crossplane, and I'll walk you through the proof of concept. I have a demo, but I think given the time that I have, I've recorded the demo, and I'll put it in GitHub for you guys. So you'll have the software, the demo, and the slides, and then you can experiment yourselves and see if this is going in the right direction. OK, so with that, let me get into a quick overview. I don't think I need to tell you about managed resources and providers. Managed resources, I heard the analogy of digital twin. So think of a managed resource as a digital twin running in Kubernetes that represents the thing that you're trying to manage. And that thing may be living within Kubernetes or outside Kubernetes, like in the, in the cloud, for instance. It could be pretty much anything. And providers are these layers that connect the managed resource with, that generates the managed resource so you can uh, manage the thing that you're uh, controlling through cross-plane. Then we have claims and composite resource definitions and so on. This is, you know, the basic. This is basic cross-plane. Now, where it gets interesting is with these functions. And if you look at the documentation, you see that functions are pieces of program. You can write them in Python and in, or in Go, if you prefer language. And these functions can be assembled in a pipeline within a cross-plane composition. So we went from this world of static templates in cross-plane that you would fill in, basically, programmatically, to this world where you have these programmatic functions where you can do whatever you want and assemble them in a pipeline and generate these resources out of thin air if you want. The, the problem with that, and you will see later, um, what that involves. So in, a, in functions, you can do loops, you can do things, whatever you want from a programmatic standpoint. You can go check on databases now. Why not? You can do pop sub against Pulsar. Why not go get a secret? Um, pretty much anything you can do programmatically. So this opens this power to the platform engineers. And how do you do it in a uh, governed way? In, in a, in a, you don't end up with, so you don't end up with spaghetti code. Now, what you see in the bottom is my, my concern. My concern as a platform architect at FICO, a lot of my time is involved with Apache Pulsar. So what you're seeing in, in yellow are the Apache Pulsar operator constructs, or CRDs, that will generate um, a tenant in Pulsar, a namespace, topics. So I use that as an example because that's the beginning of my proof of concept when I began this journey. And so the output of this pipeline is the managed resources that consists of a composite resource called the X-Platform Tenant. That's like the overarching composite resource. And underneath, I have a tenant, a Pulsar tenant, a namespace, and a topic. Very good. It doesn't sound so difficult. You submit a claim. Your pipeline wakes up within the composition. These things run. Boom, and you get your stuff on the other end, a factory, right? Not so fast. You know, when I started playing with these functions, and by the way, I, I don't know a lot about the static side of cross-plane. You know, folks here are, you know, can build very sophisticated uh, infrastructure components with templates and create very sophisticated, you know, complete platforms with VPCs and subnets and internet gateways and all the stuff statically. I haven't focused on that. I'm, I've, focused, I've been focusing on the function side, so I'm fairly new to cross-plane. Now, what I learned through the hard knocks is that this, this calling of functions in a pipeline doesn't happen linearly, not quite. Uh, yes, the, the cross-plane will receive a claim to create something through the pipeline, and then the first function gets invoked. But there is a loop going on. And if you read the documentation carefully, you'll see the loop in their sequence diagrams. 
So function number one says, oh, I need to create some resources. And it launches its logic and does its thing. But it needs to ask Crossplane to ask Kubernetes what's going on with the resources I'm creating. And so there's a loop, and there's a limit of five loops so that they don't go indefinitely. But while that, while that loop is going on in function one, function two gets called, because function one will finish its job and asynchronously keep asking <laughs> Kubernetes, what's going on with my stuff? It's like going to a, a food court, and you're, you stand in line. That line is your pipeline. And the first customer orders, second customer comes in, and so on. Then you stand on the side waiting. Like in Starbucks, you're waiting around here for your stuff, and your stuff is not showing up. So you start asking, where's my stuff? And then people are behind the counter. Your stuff, what is it you ordered? So this is going on. Uh, this is basically what's going on. You have these functions that are sitting already, or, you know, made their, their job, and they're waiting over here to see if their stuff is ready. Very natural because they're leveraging the Kubernetes reconciliation loop. Now, if you're writing functions that do stuff like application developers do, you'll be in trouble. Because if I'm uh, doing a query in a database to go get templates, I'm not going to get called once. I'm going to get called multiple times. If, for instance, I'm calling Kyberno to do something, I'm not going to get called once. Your function gets called over and over and again. So it gets a little more comp The programming model gets a little bit more complicated. So you, got, you have to be aware of these loops. OK, fine. So some of the challenges with functions. Number one, like any good software development, you want separation of concerns so that um, you have better control. And if those concerns change, you, you're not affecting the whole because one part changed. Second, um, you got to deal with those reconciliation loops. They're not going to go away. In fact, they'll, they'll probably get more intense with time. And then if you have all these programmatic functionality, why not take advantage of state stores? I want to pull things from a key value store. And uh, I, go, I want to go after secret vaults, pop some middleware, workflows, encryption, and so on. I, you know, you want to build complicated stuff because you're building a platform that in our case is not just for infrastructure. We're building everything on our one engineering system. It's not just the infrastructure. It's everything on top. So you may need sophisticated capabilities to go after repositories, they'll pull things that are at, running at the application layer, at the middleware layer, and so on, all the way up the stack. So the next thing is, OK, well, you want to write to common APIs. Let's say you want to access a database. You want a common API so that if you move to a different cloud provider or you use a different database, you don't have to re rewrite your code. And then finally, you want to do all this and still take advantage of the cross-point power of developing on your workstation, rendering the stuff you're rendering, and then deploying in Kubernetes without changes. So you, you want that, 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 that uh, developer experience with it. So how, do you, how can you make this better if you're just chiseling code by hand, Python and Go? Well, one, day, one way is with Dapper. So what does Dapper bring to the table? This is my, I got two slides on Dapper, the rest are independent. So what is Dapper? Distributed application runtime. It's been around since 2019. It just graduated this year uh, from incubation. What it provides you is a framework to build distributed systems. So on the application API side, on the, on the customer application facing API, you can write applications with, through an HTTP REST API or through gRPC using an SDK. That's your view of the, of the world. You access Dapper through an API, HTTP or gRPC. Dapper offers building blocks. What are the building blocks? They're a set of cost-cutting concerns, the things that you as an application developer would need. You want to access a state store. You want to do pop sub. You want to access a secret. You want to fire a workflow. You want to access uh, some external system through uh, asynchronous binding to something. These building blocks are part of Dapper, and each building block can be underneath that building block. You can access different technologies. So for instance, state store. Well, it could be DynamoDB and AWS. It could be MySQL, PostgreSQL, uh, Redis, and so on. You get the idea. The API remains the same, but the building block is decoratively, can be decoratively changed 
You don't have to change anything. And here comes the other, the other thing about Dapper. Dapper exploits the sidecar model. So all the logic in Dapper is running on a sidecar or a daemon set nowadays. You can deploy Dapper as a daemon set. But the, the traditional model, the mental model is you have a sidecar with all the logic in Dapper and then um, it, all these building blocks are part of that sidecar. My application, the only touch point to Dapper is that API. Uh, therefore, if I want to reconfigure Dapper, it's a manifest in Kubernetes, and then I'm pointing something else. One day I'm, I'm accessing Kafka, next day I'm accessing Pulsar. And pretty much the parameters between, say, Kafka and Pulsar are decoratively defined in a manifest for that particular technology stack. Pretty cool. Now, so this slide I configured for cross-plane. So this is right, by the way, the Dapper community has a Dapper PowerPoint deck. So if you ever find yourself in the need of pre to present Dapper, all the slides are in the Dapper community. So what I did is I morphed the Dapper slides to match cross-plane. So now instead of just a generic microservice that will use Dapper, I'm talking about cross-plane functions in this, in this context, okay? So this is the, a bird's eye view of the building blocks, and underneath you have some of the technologies that support that state store, uh, that, sorry, that building block. And these are built by the community. So Dapper came out with a state, I'm using the state store example, or pops up, and then the community and Kafka and Pulsar and so on come in and they write the, um, the, the adapter for that building block. All, all these building blocks are written in Go, so the sidecar is pretty, the footprint is pretty small. So in my, uh, the other aspect I mentioned it here is that when you want to configure a building block, you use a manifest. So like any other Kubernetes resource, you have a manifest that says, here's a state store that I'm using, it's Redis today, and here are the parameters for, for Redis. Uh, so for the POC that I ran with Kyberno, um, I used the state store building block, the secrets building block, the distributed lock, which came super really handy, and I'll get into it, and then the service invocation service block, or building block. And then on the next steps, what I have after this week is to go after a pop sub uh, with the outbox uh, pattern. I'll get into that in a minute. Um, and also the external configuration building block. These don't make sense, a lot of sense right now, but it will make sense in a few minutes. Um, from the deployment standpoint, if you want to deploy Dapper, Dapper has its own control plane, a set of operators to inject Dapper, for instance, in your, in your application. In this case, your application is cross-plane functions. And this is what I'm going to cover right now. Um, this um, diagram comes directly from the cross-plane documentation, and it, I just want to illustrate where Dapper fits in. You can find this in the latest cross-plane doc, and it's all about the sequence diagram of how uh, functions get invoked. So a claim arrives, uh, reaches the uh, Kubernetes API, cross-plane wakes up, says I have a claim, what's the composition, it goes with it, fine, here's the composition, open it up, there's a pipeline, functions, okay, call the function. Inside the function, the function does its thing, and there's a loop here, and that's the, the famous loop where the function is going and getting resources from crossplane or from Kubernetes, crossplane on behalf of, of the function to find out what's going on. And then this, this, this continues. This flow is for one function, but it will happen concurrently for all the functions you have in your pipeline. Where Dapper comes in is here. So Dapper is only, the function is the only component that's aware that it has Dapper, and so it's calling Dapper at the application level to do something. Go get me this template from a database. Instead of reading it hard-coded in the composition, let me go to MongoDB and get a template for my particular resource. I'm going to call uh, another microservice somewhere else to do something in in specific. I'm going to pop sub I'm going to publish a message at the end of my composition to notify GitHub or some dashboard that the composition is done. So that's the sort of thing that Dapper will do at the end. To install Dapper, there's a CLI. Uh, you just install the Dapper CLI to brew or some other uh, mechanism in Windows. You can do an init in your laptop 
and it will spin a couple of containers where you'll have, you'll have a state store and a pop sub as Redis containers running on your laptop. So you can start developing on Dapper right there on your laptop. And then if you, if you can, if you have a, DAX, uh, a sandbox where you can do this, you can do a Dapper init minus K, and it will launch Dapper, um, Dapper in your Kubernetes, typically in a, in a more you know, governed location, you you run a Dapper Helm chart. But if you're running on a sandbox and you have a Kubernetes uh, system that you, you have line of sight to, you can just issue a Dapper init minus K, and off you go with your Dapper control plane running on, on Kubernetes. So this is all the setup for, OK, what do we do? How do we make this thing work? This is out of the, the template for a Python project from Crossplane, and I'm more I know I'm more handy with Python than I am with Go, but what I'm going to say works for both. The template is great. You just clone a template project for Python, and you have everything you need to test locally your cross-plane functions and to deploy them in Kubernetes. So it's wonderful. So I didn't want to mess with it too much, and I still wanted to make it work with Dapper. So how do you do that? A little surgery. So the first surgery you do in the Python environment is I, I want to access Dapper from my cross-plane function with a minimum of um, crosstalk or the minimum of touch. So the easiest thing would be to HTTP, do an HTTP REST call. I do that with a request, the Python request package. You can use HTTPX. I chose request. So all you need is that line in the dependencies in your Python project TOML file. Number one, change number one. Because when you run your function locally and in down when the Docker file gets generated for you, um, the tools within the template is Hatch is the project manager in the Python environment will pull this request package locally and also will generate it the, the Docker container at the end when you're deploying in Kubernetes. So this is a must. If you miss it, then it will you'll give you an you'll get you an, an error. Um, that's pretty much it from the request standpoint. The other thing is, okay, you have a function in Crossplane. Under the hood, this CRD called function in, in Crossplane, under the hood is generating a deployment in Kubernetes. So the goal is to inject a Dapper sidecar in that deployment. So how do you do that? The way you do that is Crossplane gives you a, a, a CRD, a, a manifest called the deployment runtime uh, config. So this manifest, which is not part of the template, is just these few lines of code over here. The deployment runtime config for your function, you add annotations that tell the function, hey, you're going to, be, you're going to ask uh, Dapper to inject a sidecar when this thing gets deployed. This, by the way, works in Kubernetes, but you'll see how you make it work locally as well. And then the next change is in the function itself, you're going to tell the function that here's your configuration file. That's it. That's pretty much all you have to do. Now, OK, you, you all set up to deploy a sidecar in Kubernetes. Well, how do I do my development locally with Dapper? Well, it turns out that Dapper, when it's running Kubernetes, yes, it runs as a sidecar, or it could run as a daemon set. The new Dapper version has something called a Dapper shared where instead of a sidecar, it deploys a daemon set, and then your applications talk to the daemon set. Similar to Istio and Ambien, same model. But what do you do on your laptop? So Dapper runs as a process in your laptop. So if you play with the cross-playing functions, you'll see that there's a, on the right side in green, you recognize in Python the command. You know, you call a hatch run uh, development, and it will launch a container with all the dependencies and your function and so on. It will be running in the background. Dapper has a similar concept. If you want to run a Dapper ICE application on your laptop, you just do a Dapper run, the name of the app, Dapper app name, and then the application name. In this case, you just marry these two commands, and now you, you got yourself a, um, a running Dapper, a running cross-plane function with Dapper on your laptop. So in the GitHub that I'll you'll point you to at the end, I just wrote a little script where you can, you can call this in one, in one line, and you're done. OK, so if you put these two things together, Crossplane and Dapper, they work really well. 
So I'll get into the Kyvernal policy validator for a minute. And what's, what's going on with Kyvernal? So Kyvernal is this powerful, is that it? Well, I got one minute left, geez. Okay, so <laughs> uh, Kyvernal is a very powerful project to deal with policies of code. Now, it works under the principle that you have admission controllers where you enforce the policies, and then you have upstream in your GitHub the ability to call Kyvernal to check on policies that are on things that are being created at the, at the CI CD level. The thing, the observation of, of what's going on with cross plane functions is that now you have this power to create all these resources dynamically it, from the thin air in your CI CD. So, at GitHub time, you probably has a, have a claim. In fact, like in my example, I have a composition. They have zero template code. All the code is coming from a database or is being generated dynamically. So Kyverna is kind of out of touch because upstream in the CICD level, it doesn't know what's going to be generated. And then if you're, if you're just trying to validate policies in the admission control, that's a big hammer. You're going to you're not gonna know what was generated until the very end. If you're the platform engineer, your composite, you can't validate right there. So the point of this POC is to give you a way to validate your, your cavernal policies within the composition as one function part of, the, part, of the, part of the composition at the very end. So if you imagine that resources are being created and handed over from one function to the next, to the next, to the next, the desire state, you can add a function at the close to the end that will get the desired resources, run Kyverno against them, and say, yeah, it passes. No, it fails. So that's the point of the proof of concept. Why? Because Crossplane can now, with function, create dynamic resources. So just in a nutshell, this is the policy validator. This function will be in the GitHub repo. It's another function written in Python on the left side very simple, it doesn't do anything other than trap the desired resources, the whole resources being generated, and uses Dapper's service to service invocation to call a microservice running outside Crossplane that has all the smarts to go after GitHub with secrets, you know, secure, go get the policies and tests for that particular composite, bring them all in, bring, bring the resources into a uh, a file system, run the Kyvernal test command, and return a pass or fail. So now your composition, when the composite resource finishes, you'll have an event in your composite resource that says, look, you, you fail. <laughs> Sorry, you failed. Um, now, I mentioned earlier that uh, there's this loop. So the, the, this function, policy validation function, is going to get called over and over again, and it is gonna call that other microservice over and over again. I don't wanna be pulling from GitHub and doing all that work over and over again unnecessarily. So that's where my distributed lock comes in. Uh, it's very easy with Dapper to write a distributed lock and say, you will lock for 50 seconds or 60 seconds and just return a status that says, I'm locked right now, don't bother me. So Dapper was very powerful in allowing me to, first of all, build dynamic resources, get them from a database, go get secrets for GitHub, pop sub at the end of the composition, lock when I didn't want the reconciliation loop to wake me up, uh, and the service to service invocation as well. All these things came together, and it's pretty easy, and all the code that is heavy lifting is in Dapper. And I have a very clean API to that Dapper sidecar to do the heavy lifting. And I think, that's, that's, that's it, that's, what, that's the goal of the POC architecture diagram, you'll get it on the slide. And then the next step is to keep going with the, uh, the, some of the features that come with Dapper. One of them is the transaction outbox, I think that's the, the biggest highlight. It is so hard to update a database and send a pop sub message and have them both happen when they work as a, as a unit of work. You, if, you send, if you update the database and then send the event, Maybe the event doesn't make it. If you flip and then you, you, you may get the event out, but the database update fails. That's hard to code. That's not a trivial thing. Dapper offers it out of the box. You just configure, I want outbox pattern run for the state store and this pub sub, and off you go. And it works with any state store or pub sub fabric. 
And with that, I thank you, and I, that's, the, that's the QR code for the GitHub repo that has the demo code with the policy validator. And if you give me a couple of days, I'll put in the, the, the MP4 recordings and the deck. Thank you so much. You're very patient. <laughs>